from a very, very early age, we are taught that if we do something wrong or say something wrong or hurt someone in any way, we are to say, sorry, sorry. yes. However, a sorry in many cases is a reluctant and sometimes just a superficial response that really does not heal the hurt done to another or bring about a change in attitude to the offender. It's a bit like a child seen hitting another child or calling another child horrible names. And caught in the act, a parent or a supervisor will say, you must say, sorry. Sorry. <coughs> I s and then when the child thinks they're not being watched, they do the same thing again. I saw you do that again. Why did you do that? He hit me first, I'm not sorry, he deserved it. And she called me nasty names, I'm not sorry, she deserved it. We know we've all been children ourselves, haven't we? I hope we've forgotten those days and learnt something. Learning to say, I forgive you, is even more difficult. Forgiveness of wrongs done against us is something that many of us find extremely difficult. Forgiveness is more than just words. It is also about healing, restoration of a broken relationship and hopefully reconciliation. However, reconciliation is only possible if the two parties are able to come together and do what they really must do to restore the relationship, either offering and or seeking forgiveness. And ideally, forgiveness produces a change in a person's attitude and life. And for some people, and very understandably, in view of the things that they may have suffered, forgiveness seems an impossible requirement. Some of you may remember a wonderful man, Bart Richardson, who served this community for over 50 years, faithfully and wonderfully, through Rotary and Legacy, and he was a parishioner, a faithful parishioner of this parish. And he was awarded an Order of Australia for his service. In 2014, at age 94, Bart wrote a book called The Army As I Saw It. Bart served in the army from 1936 to 1945 at the end of World War II. And he was in Singapore in 1942 when the Allied forces fell to the Japanese. They surrendered and Bart became a prisoner of war. In 2011, the Japanese government invited a group of former prisoner of wars to travel to Japan, and Bart was invited to be one of that group. But he said he was not interested in Japan or the Japanese, and that Japan was the last place he would ever want to go. However, after some consideration, Bart decided that after 70 years, it probably was time for reconciliation. And for 70 years, Bart had carried hatred in his heart for the way he and other prisoner of wars had been treated. So along with his daughter as his carer and four other prisoners of war and their carers, he went to Japan. The group flew business class, stayed in five-star hotels, had luxury travel all the way around Japan and all their expenses were paid by the Japanese government. And they were treated with great respect and honour and given three official apologies from the government of Japan for the treatment they received as prisoners of war. And the last sentence in Bart's book reads, Reconciliation is a great thing. I can't forget. And now there is no one to forgive. But there is no point in continually hating people now dead for, the some, for something they did many years ago. Bart's story is exceptional, but I tell you this is um, his story um, as an example of how difficult, almost impossible it was for Bart, a Christian man, to forgive. Today's Gospel passage, thank you Ian, the next slide. Today's Gospel passage makes a crucial link between God forgiving us and our forgiving others. Jesus has been teaching his disciples how to deal with fellow Christians who sin against them. And this prompts Peter, always keen to impress Jesus, to suggest he would forgive his brother seven times. Jesus, however, in saying that his disciples should be prepared to forgive 77 times, 
means that Christian forgiveness should be unlimited. And some commentaries I read said, a good paraphrase of Jesus' answer might be, more times than you can possibly imagine, or don't even think about counting, just do it. Imagine the disciples' reaction. How could unlimited forgiveness be possible? To justify this call for forgiveness without limit, Jesus tells the parable of the unforgiving servant. The servant who owed 10,000 talents was probably a high official who um, responsible for the delivering of the taxes of the province that he oversaw. And he owed the equivalent of millions of dollars, a hopeless debt which he could never repay. Yet when the servant begged to be forgiven, to be given more time, the king was compassionate and went beyond his request for giving him the entire debt. The king expected his generosity to affect this man's behaviour towards others. Yet once he was set free, the slave found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a relatively small amount, the equal of a hundred days' work. And the fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. And he could pay him. Unlike the king, who showed great mercy in forgiving him his entire huge debt, the servant had no pity on his fellow servant. He violently attacked the man and demanded that he be, replayed, he be repaid immediately. And he inflicted on his fellow slave the punishment that he had been threatened with, and he throws him into prison. The key to this parable lies in the king's furious words, you wicked slave, should you not have shown mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? In the next slide, Ian, please. And these words of Jesus and the parable linked to them take us back to the Lord's Prayer as it is presented in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 13. And every Sunday as we recite the Lord's Prayer, we say, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And further commenting on these words, Matthew writes in the following verses in the Sermon on the Mount, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. There are two very clear messages from both the parable and the words of the Sermon on the Mount. The first is that we dare not hold back forgiveness for those who God forgives. And we know from the parable, from the Gospel reading today, that God's attitude to wrong, we know about his attitude to wrongdoers and his divine grace for forgiveness. But the second message is that divine patience is not infinite. God, as Jesus tells us to do, is ready to forgive 77 times. And when it comes to forgiveness of our sins, we take this for granted, don't we? Imagine if God were to say to us, in your lifetime I'll give you five chances to repent and after that you've had it. At the same time, there is a limit to the extent of God's forgiveness in the sense that it is conditional. That condition is determined first by our readiness to respond to his forgiveness through our repentance and conversion. And second, by our willingness to imitate him in practising forgiveness of those we feel who have offended or hurt us. If we truly understand how immeasurable a debt God has forgiven us, we will forgive others for the comparably small debt, the smaller sins that they commit against us. And I know this is all very difficult teaching and, and there are some um, common misunderstandings about what forgiveness really means in practice. And we can relate some of these to Bart's story. We hear people say, forgive and forget. To forgive, you must also forget. And of course, this is not always realistic, especially when serious crimes have been committed. Forgiveness does not necessarily involve forgetting, but it does affect how we take those memories into the future 
preventing them from consuming us with hatred and vindictiveness. And another misunderstanding is that forgiveness always brings reconciliation. And whilst that is often so, and that's what we hope and pray happens, there are times when reconciliation simply isn't a safe or a sensible option, as might be the case in abusive relationships. And forgiveness denies, um, involves denying that our hurt matters. We can think that forgiveness involves playing down the importance of what happened to us. But if forgiveness is to be true and lasting, it must involve confronting sin and being honest about our pain. Forgiveness is often a gradual process, one which takes time and for which we need the help of others. To rush through it by sweeping it under the carpet, so to speak, can be dangerous. But by asking God to forgive us, God isn't overlooking the seriousness of the sin that has happened, but asking us to leave any retribution to him, and I think that's important. And another misunderstanding is forgiveness is primarily about our feelings. But actually, forgiveness is an act of will, a choice which affects how we behave. We may still struggle with negative feelings even after forgiving someone. But God is concerned for our willingness to try, not in our instant success. And he will be there to help us through it all. For Jesus, forgiveness and participation in it are fundamental signs of the kingdom of God. We heard those words in the, in the gospel passage. And the gospel teaches us that God's love is boundless and, his, um, and God's forgiveness is without limit. And we are taught to, to forgive that we may be forgiven. The capacity to forgive in it, is in itself a grace. And for many, as it was for Bart, it will be a lifelong project to be sought in prayer and supplication from God. Brendan Byrne, thank you, Ian. Brendan Byrne, in his commentary, writes, What Jesus requires is forgiveness from the heart. That is, from that radical core of a person that is the domain of God and that only God's grace can ultimately touch and heal. Forgiveness and unforgiveness may long wrestle in human hearts, but God takes the long view and will never deny the grace necessary for salvation. Your wonderful words from Brendan Byrne. By practising forgiveness, we show that we fully comprehend how much God has loved us and forgiven us, and through it we can know the joy of working with him to pass on the grace that we have experienced to others. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. <clears throat> Loving God, when we do not forgive others, we make a barrier against your forgiveness. When we hold resentments, they fester and make us spiritually and sometimes physically ill. We thank you, God, that your Holy Spirit can bring to light the things that hurt and can take from us our bitterness and our resentment. We pray that we may gladly relinquish these things so that your grace and power may heal the hurts and restore true relationships. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.